Julius Caesar, the political play by William Shakespeare, opens with Caesar, the hero of the play and the present ruler of Rome. Returning in triumph after a victory in Spain over the sons of his old enemy, Pompey the Great. Jealous of his growing power, Cassius, a Roman senator and longtime acquaintance of Caesar, instigates a conspiracy to assassinate Caesar. Cassius persuades Marcus Brutus, a noble senator and a personal friend of Caesar, to join the conspiracy. The conspirators plan to assassinate Caesar at the Capitol when he sits in the Senate on the Ides of March. Act 2, Scene 2 is set in Caesar's house during a night of thunder and lightning. Caesar comments on the tumultuous weather and Calpurnia's nightmare. No heaven, no earth have been at peace tonight. Thrice hath Calpurnia in her sleep cried out, Help ho, they murder Caesar! Who's within? My lord. Go bid the priest do present sacrifice and bring me their opinion of success. I will, my lord. What mean you, Caesar? Think you to walk forth? You shall not stir out of your house today. Caesar shall forth. The things that threaten me never looked but on my back. When they shall see the face of Caesar, they are vanished. Caesar, I never stood on ceremonies, yet now they fright me. There is one within. Besides the thing that we have heard and seen, recounts most horrid sight seen by the watch. A lioness hath welt in the streets, and graves have yawned and yielded up their dead. Fierce, fiery warriors fought upon the clouds in ranks and squadrons in right form of war, which drizzled blood upon the capital. The noise of battle hurtled in the air. Horses did neigh and dying men did groan, and ghosts did shriek and squeal about the streets. O oh Caesar, these things are beyond all use, and I do fear them. What can be avoided? Whose end is purposed by the mighty gods? Yet Caesar shall go forth. For these predictions are to the world in general, as to Caesar. When beggars die, they are no comet seen. The heavens themselves blaze for the death of princes. <laughs> Cowards die many times before their death. The valiant never taste of death but once. Of all the wonders that I yet have heard, it seems to me most strange that men should fear, seeing that death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. Hmm, what say the augurers? They would not have you to stir forth today. Plucking the entrails of an offering forth, they could not find a heart within the beast. The gods do this in shame of cowardice. Caesar should be a beast without a heart, if he should stay at home today for fear. No, Caesar shall not. Danger knows full well that Caesar is more dangerous than he. We are two lions littered in one day, and I the elder and more terrible, and Caesar shall go forth. Alas, my lord, your wisdom is consumed in confidence. Do not go forth today. Call it my fear that keeps you in the house and not your own. We'll send Mark Antony to the Senate House. And he shall say you're not well today. Let me upon my knee prevail in this. Hmm. Mark Antony shall say I am not well. And for thy humor, I will stay at home.
Here's Decius Brutus. He shall tell them so. Caesar, all hail. Good morrow, worthy Caesar. I come to fetch you to the Senate House. And you are come in very happy time to bear my greeting to the Senators and tell them that I will not come today. Cannot is false and that I dare not falser. I will not come today. Tell them so, Decius. Say he is sick. Shall Caesar send a lie? Have I in conquest stretched mine arm so far to be afraid to tell Greybeards the truth? Theseus, go tell them, Caesar will not come. Most mighty Caesar, let me know some cause, lest I be laughed at when I tell them so. Galpurnia here, my wife, stays me at home. She dreamt tonight she saw my statue, which, like a fountain with an hundred spouts, did run pure blood. And many lusty Romans came smiling and did bathe their hands in it. <laughs> and these does she apply for warnings and portents and evils imminent. And on her knee hath begged that I will stay at home today. This dream is all misinterpreted. It was a vision, fair and fortunate. Your statue spouting blood in many pipes, in which so many smiling Romans bathed, signifies that from you, great Rome shall suck, reviving blood, and that great men shall press for tinctures, stains, relics, and cognizance. This by Calpurnia's dream is signified. And this way, have you well expounded it? I have, when you have heard what I can say, and know it now. The Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. If you shall send them word you will not come, their minds may change. How foolish do your fears seem now, Calpurnia? I'm ashamed I did yield to them. Give me my robe, for I will go. Good friends, go in and taste some wine with me. And we, like friends, will straightway go together. That every like is not the same, O Caesar. The heart of Brutus yearns to think upon. to go to the Senate House, yielding to Calpurnia's persuasion. Decius Brutus interpreted Calpurnia's dream as a favorable indication and appealed to Caesar's vanity by suggesting that the Senate was ready to crown him as the king of all Roman territory. Certainly, Caesar couldn't refuse the offer and was convinced of the rightness of attending the meeting at the Senate House in the Capitol.
Are we all ready? What is now amiss? That Caesar and his Senate must redress? Most high, most mighty, most puissant Caesar, metalous cymbal throws before thy seat an humble heart. I must prevent thee, Simba. These couchings and these lowly curtsies might fire the blood of ordinary men and turn pre-ordinance and first decree into the law of children. Thy brother, by decree, is banished. If thou dost bend and pray and fawn for him, I spurn thee like a cur out of my way. No, Caesar doth not wrong, nor without cause will he be satisfied. Is there no voice more worthy than my own to sound most sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother? I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar, desiring thee that Publius Simba may have an immediate freedom of repeal. What, Brutus? Pardon, Caesar. Caesar, pardon. As low as to thy foot doth Cassius fall. To back enfranchisement for Publius Simba. Cassius, I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, prayers would move me. But I am constant as the northern star of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. I was constant. Simba should be banished. And constant do remain. Speak! Hands for me! Oh! 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 Then fall, Caesar. Liberty! Freedom! Tyranny is dead! Run hands! Proclaim! Cry it about the streets! Some to the common pulpits and cry out, Liberty, freedom and enfranchisement! But here comes Antony. Welcome, Mark Antony. O oh, mighty Caesar, dost thou lie so low? Are all thy conquests, glories, triumphs, spoils shrunk to this little measure? Mark Antony is deeply affected by Caesar's assassination. But being a shrewd politician, he hides his feelings and pretends reconciliation with the conspirators. He shakes the hands of each of them and requests permission to make a speech at Caesar's funeral. He has a plan to persuade the populace to his side at the funeral oration and turn them against the conspirators. In spite of Cassius's objections, Brutus grants this with certain conditions that Brutus will give his speech first and Antony can speak afterwards, provided that he only says positive things about the conspirators. When the conspirators have departed, Antony begs pardon of Caesar's dead body for his having been meek and gentle with the conspirators. He vows to seek revenge on Brutus and his cohorts by inciting the public and subsequently launching a civil war. Here, let us meet Brutus, confidently moving to the pulpit for giving his reasons why Caesar's murder was necessary. My will be satisfied! Let us be satisfied! 
satisfied! Then follow me and give me audience, friends. I will hear Brutus speak. The noble Brutus is ascended. Silence! Be patient till the last. Romans, countrymen, and lovers, hear me for my cause and be silent, that you may hear. Believe me for mine honor and have respect to mine honor, that you may believe. Censure me in your wisdom and awake your senses, that you may the better judge. If there be any in this assembly, any dear friend of Caesar's, to him I say that Brutus's love to Caesar was no less than his. If then that friend demand why Brutus rose against Caesar, this is my answer. Not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Had you rather Caesar were living and die all slaves than that Caesar were dead to live all free men? As Caesar loved me, I weep for him. As he was fortunate, I rejoice at it. As he was valiant, I honor him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. There is tears for his love, joy for his fortune, honor for his valor, and death for his ambition. Who is here so base that would be a bondman? If any, speak, for him have I offended. Who is here so rude that would not be a Roman? If any, speak, for him have I offended. Who is here so vile that will not love his country? If any, speak, for him have I offended. I pause for a reply. None, Brutus, none! Then none have I offended. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. Here comes his body, mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the commonwealth, as which of you shall not. With this I depart, that, as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself when it shall please my country to need my death. The rational and intellectual speech of Brutus has appealed to the minds of the people who are fickle by nature. They have cheered Brutus and expressed their willingness to crown him as next Caesar. At this juncture, Antony arrives, carrying Caesar's dead body, ready to deliver the famous funeral oration of flawless logic and emotional appeal. Friends, Romans, countrymen, Lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often turred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Yeah, under leave of Brutus and the rest. For Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus 
is an honorable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal, I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious. And sure, he is an honorable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? Oh, judgment! Thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar. I must pause till it come back to me. Methinks there is much reason in his sayings. If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Mark ye his words? He would not take the crown. Therefore, it's certain he was not ambitious. Poor soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. Now mark him, he begins again to speak. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there. And none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honorable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honorable men. But. Here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. And they would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds and dip their napkins in his sacred blood. Yeah, beg a hair of him for memory and dying mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. We'll hear the will. Read it, Mark Antony. The will! The will! We will hear Caesar's will. Have patience, gentle friends. I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. And being men, bearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you. It will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs. For if you should, oh, what would come of it? In contrast to the idealistic speech of Brutus, Antony's speech is a combination of art, wit and cunningness, which directly appeals to the hearts of the people. He has aroused the curiosity of the people, 
showing the will of Caesar, but he doesn't read it immediately. He wants to stir the emotions of the Romans more by exposing the wounds on Caesar's dead body. He lays stress on the wound given by Brutus. It was the unkindest cut of all. He wants to emphasize that Brutus's betrayal had killed Caesar more than the wound. After successfully playing on the pathos of his audience, he reads the will of Caesar and inflames them to rise in rebellion and seek revenge on the conspirators. Here is the will, and under Caesar's seal, to every Roman citizen, he gives to every several man 75 drachmas. Most noble Caesar will revenge his death. Oh, royal Caesar, hear me with patience. Peace, oh! Moreover, he hath left you all his walks, his private harbors, and new planted orchards. It's on this side, Tiber, he hath left them to you and to your heirs forever. Common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Yeah, was a Caesar. When comes such another? Never, never! Come away, away! We'll burn his body in the holy place! And with the brand's fire, the traitor's houses! Take up the body! Go! Fetch fire! Lock down benches! Lock down bombs, windows, anything! Now, let it work. Mischief thou art afoot. Take thou what course thou wilt. Antony has succeeded fully to inflame the Roman mob, to rise in rebellion and seek revenge on the conspirators. They drive away the conspirators from Rome. Meanwhile, Antony sits with Octavius Caesar, Julius Caesar's nephew, coldly calculating how to purge any future threat. Finally, the armies of Octavius Caesar and Antony clash with those of Brutus and Cassius at Philippi and Sardis. Brutus and Cassius are defeated and both commit suicide. Thus, Caesar's assassination has been avenged, fulfilling the predictions of Antony, order has been restored, and most importantly, the Roman Empire has been preserved.